We're in week three of our series called Face to Face. We're talking about the face-to-face -face meetings that Jesus had with people in the, in the Gospels, the stories about Jesus' life. I wanna take us back to our text and to take a look at that in Luke chapter 19, where this meeting takes place. It says this, When Jesus reached the spot where Zacchaeus was, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. This is an incredible encounter. We had a great time talking about it this weekend. But I just want to note today, we get behind the idea of God forgiving the person who's down and out, the people who have been mistreated by the system. But Zacchaeus is the system. Zacchaeus is not disenfranchised. He is the most franchised. He was the chief tax collector. He's the boss man at the final level of Jericho's predatory tax system. So it's no surprise that the crowds, when they see Jesus welcoming him and saying, I'm going to your home, begin to point their fingers at Zacchaeus to judge him. It's not too different than what we see happen in our world today. People haven't changed that much. We love to point the finger. We love to look at others and talk about how, how wrong they are, but we rarely remember the thumb. So it could be the pointer or it could be the thumb. And what I want to talk about today is getting to thumbs, not pointers. Jesus knew the hearts in the crowd. He could see every person who was judging Zacchaeus, and he knew that the pointer fingers were no better. The ones who were there judging weren't any different on the inside. It's not that they had done the same thing as Zacchaeus, but they had the same sinful, raw material at work in their lives and in their hearts as Zacchaeus did. One of the most terrifying moments in life um, is when you walk into the cafeteria as a, as a young person, as, as maybe like a, a junior higher, without your friend. And it could be one of the most traumatic experiences of a teenage life when somebody says, oh, this seat is taken. And, and, and you experience that these little tribes everywhere that have been formed at the lunchroom tables. And they, they happen kind of by category. And if you don't fit in in that place, it can be traumatizing. Zacchaeus in the lunchroom was a sad sight. People were scooting over to make sure that he couldn't sit with them. People were saying, I'm sorry, this seat is taken. But then Jesus comes along on this day and he says, pull up a seat at my table, Zacchaeus. You can sit here next to me. It was so unexpected that it scandalized the whole town. It didn't just confuse people, it offended people. They hated this man and his unfair privilege and now, he was gonna receive preferential treatment? And so the text tells us that they began to mutter. What a great word, muttering. It's, it's one of those onomatopoeic words that just kind of sounds like it is when the whole crowd begins to mutter, mutter, mutter. And so you have the muttering of the crowds and then it's contrasted against the magnanimity of Jesus. Big word, right? That's a, that's a $4 word, it means this. It means loftiness of spirit enabling one to disdain meanness and pettiness and to display a noble generosity. It means kindness towards someone, especially after defeating them or being treated badly by them. Or it can mean greatness of spirit, magnanimity. Now we know Zacchaeus was a wee little man. He was a small man. But I'm suggesting today that the people in the crowd were even smaller. But then, you see how Jesus towers over them all because of his greatness of spirit, his generosity of spirit. Jesus forgives Zacchaeus before Zacchaeus even asks. Jesus showed that he was the bigger man and that kind of generous love is a big deal. It's not just 
a side dish in the kingdom of God. It's the entree in the kingdom of God. We should be surprising people with how we love those that we don't like, those that have wronged us, those that have, those that have done us dirty. It's easy to love some people in our lives, right? Most of us have a mother, I'm just picking an easy one. Most of us have a mother who's easy to love. And if you don't, you're probably working that out in therapy as we speak good on you. But think of somebody besides that who's hard for you to love, difficult for you to love. And when you begin to think of them, your face is probably going to change. You're going to get a knot in your, uh, in your stomach. You're going to have some feelings about it. And let me tell you, that's who we are called to love. Unforgiveness is a root that produces unbelief. Here is where you have to be careful. Because when you hold judgment over others, when you stand in judgment over another person, when you are unwilling to, to release them and forgive them, you are now one step away from judging God. You see, the crowds, they were already pointing their finger at Zacchaeus. But just right after that, they begin to point a finger at Jesus. And they say, who is this guy who's eating with him? And now, instead of just judging Zacchaeus, they're actually judging Jesus. In almost every instance that I know of, where a person who had a vibrant, meaningful faith walks away from that and becomes jaded or bitter and, 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 and gets lost in unbelief, in almost every one of those instances, I can point to an unresolved offense or an area of unforgiveness that preceded that. You see, I understand why it's difficult to forgive. The reason we struggle with forgiveness is because it always costs something. If you're gonna be the person who's gonna end that cycle of hatred, uh, of anger, of retribution or revenge, if you're gonna be the person who says it's gonna stop with me, then that means that you're gonna be the person who pays a price. We pay the price when we decide not to pass it on. And that can be painful, but that is exactly what God has done for you and me. Is there someone, I have to ask you, is there someone in your life or are, is there a group of people in your, in your life that you have hated the thought of forgiving them because you could feel how much it would cost you? Let me ask you, how much did it cost God to forgive you? I challenged you this weekend to think of the order of grace. God shows us his unmerited love and his favor and his forgiveness. He does that first before we ever ask for it. And because of God's grace, we can do that for others. That's the key. The more we lean into the magnanimous love of God, the more we can live it out.